Amen. You may be seated. It is good to see you this morning at HBF. My name is Brian. I'll be preaching this morning. If you're joining us live on Facebook, we're glad that you're here with us this morning. And uh, we hope to see you here real soon. Thank you for those who are joining us this morning for the first time. I hope you enjoy those Tootsie Rolls and all the goodies in that bag. It's a good, good deal. <clears throat> if you have your Bibles, we turn the book of Acts. We're in Acts chapter 21. We've been looking at uh, our DNA as we've been coming through the last half of the book of Acts. Of course, we saw that incredible start by the 12 apostles and, uh, of course, Matthias making up that 12th. We worked our way through the calling of the Apostle Paul and now the establishing of the Gentile church. We spent several weeks looking at the Apostle Paul's preparation to depart out of Acts chapter 20. And this morning, uh, we're in Acts 21. If you don't have a Bible, grab one from the seat rack in front of you and be turned to page 857. And really what we're going to see this morning is the end of the beginning. Now you're often uh, accustomed to hearing people say the beginning of the end. Well, there is no end uh, because we go on for eternity. But we do see the end of the beginning of the church as we go from chapter 21 through chapter 28. And we see the, the, basically the final run of the Apostle Paul as uh, we see the, the end of his ministry recorded there. Of course, we get more information uh, through the, the epistles of uh, 2 Timothy and and uh, some other places in the New Testament. But in essence, we see the end of the beginning of the local New Testament church, and, and therefore our DNA, spiritually, has been established. And really a lot of, the, of what makes us us, even in this church this day, is what we've already have and what we will continue to see as we finish up the book of Acts. And so um, <clears throat> uh, this morning, we, we're going to focus in the first 17 verses of Acts chapter 21. And, and uh, again, if you don't have a Bible, grab one from the seat rack in front of you. We're going to be on the bottom part of page 857, uh, if that is the, the version of, the, of our... Now, that, I'm going to confuse someone right away. So we have all King James Bibles that we published here, but we have different... Uh, iterations that we put out. So uh, I think we're, I think the one under the seat rack is going to put you on page 857 if you're looking for a page number. All right, so this morning's message is titled very simply. This is not going to wow anybody. This is probably the most unimpressive title ever. Traveling to Jerusalem, right? So, uh, woohoo! You remember that. All right, but that's what Paul was getting ready to do, right? He spent all this time getting ready for his departure so he could travel to Jerusalem. But it's a big deal. Jerusalem's a big deal. No matter when, where, what, why. Ever since God established that as the place in which he's going to fulfill his prophecy to rule this world through his people, the nation of Israel, Jerusalem's been a big deal. It is a big deal to this day. World, war, world wars have been fought and uh, won. Uh, so that God could move his people back to the promised land, even though they're not regenerate. Uh, God is working to prepare his people <coughs> for the Messiah, though they rejected him 2,000 years ago. So Jerusalem, traveling to Jerusalem is a big deal. And ironically, we have two of our men, uh, Steve Fleshman and Luke Fleshman. So Angie and Brenda are, are ministry widows this weekend uh, as, uh, as your husbands. I don't know where Angie's. She skipped out on me. But, uh, but uh, as their husbands are, are now on the ground, <coughs> I got a text. I, I got it too late to put in the PowerPoint. I got a text this morning from uh, Steve. They landed in Tel Aviv about the time we were starting church. So they are literally traveling to Jerusalem with our Living Faith Fellowship uh, church uh, partners there, and uh, Mark Trotter and and uh, Pastor Alan Shelby will be leading that trip. So uh, that'll be good. So be praying for Luke and for Steve, or Steve and Luke, in whichever order, and uh, <clears throat> and just pray that they have safe passage as they will literally be traveling to Jerusalem. And of course, I timed this. You know, I was like, I got to make sure I land everything. No, no, God, God has way more uh, wisdom than I do. So it just so happens this morning that I'm talking about traveling to Jerusalem on the day that these two men from our church are traveling to Jerusalem. So that's pretty cool. At least I think it is. All right. Maybe not to you, but I think it's cool. So this morning, we're going to look in Acts 21, and we're going to see Paul. He leaves um, that touching scene that we saw at the end of Acts chapter 20, where he's, uh, you know, they're crying, they're weeping, they're snotting, they're hugging, they're doing all that stuff. And there's like, man, Paul, we hate, to, we hate the fact that, you know, you're not going to be with us. But uh, this is the last time you're going to see us. And it's the last time we're going to see you. And it's a hard. And saying goodbye is hard. You know, it's just that uh, I just, this last couple of weeks, been, been to fu done funeral, been to funerals. And it's hard to say goodbye, isn't it? And that's why what we do is so important when it comes to believing, receiving, preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because we really never want to say goodbye. We want to say 
so long, right? See you again. And so we can spend eternity with our loved ones. And so the good news uh, allows that to happen. So really, Ephesians, uh, the church at Ephesus, the elders there uh, that met down in Miletus, didn't really say goodbye forever. They just said goodbye until we get to heaven. And so that was a blessing. And that's where we left off. Now in Acts chapter 21, I'm just going to give you a quick flyover. Acts chapter 21, verses 1 through 17. You see that Paul travels. We will see that this morning here in just a moment. We'll read this. But Paul travels to Jerusalem. That's all we're going to be able to bite off this morning. But I will point out that um, it was important, obviously. And it's going to be key to the rest of what we see as Paul then ends up heading to Rome. In Acts chapter 21, verses 18 through 19, when he gets to Jerusalem, he's there to do what he wants to do. The main thing that he's called to do, and that's to give his testimony, right? To testify of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he does that to the leaders of the church in Jerusalem. We'll see that next week. And then uh, he runs into a little trouble as he goes to the temple in Acts chapter 21, verses 20 through 40. And so we really won't get to see his presentation and testimony uh, to the nation of it, or to the leaders in the temple until Acts chapter 22. So, uh, but it is important to note that in Acts chapter 21 and verse 33, we won't get there this morning. But this is the last time that Paul will be a free man. Uh, he's spending his freedom traveling to Jerusalem, and by the time he gets to verse 33, he will be in the custody of Rome, and will remain there until the end of his life. And so, if you have your Bible, Acts chapter 21, let's look at the first 17 verses, and then we'll, we'll begin to break down this message and this, this uh, text here in just a few moments. Acts chapter 21, let's stand again as we look at God's Word. And Acts chapter 21, verse 1, <clears throat> the notice the and, right? So all of us kids that grew up on that uh, conjunction, junction, what's your function, right? We know that's connecting us to the previous chapter. So after that, after the sorrow and the... And the uh, goodbyes that were accomplished at Ephesus and starts off the chapter 21. It came to pass that after we, we were gotten from them and had launched, we came with a straight course unto Kos. Now it looks like Kus, but it's Kos. And the day following unto Rhodes and from thence unto Patera. And finding a ship sailing over unto Phoenicia, we went aboard and set forth. Now, when we had discovered Cyprus, we left it on the left hand and sailed unto Syria and landed at Tyre. For there the ship was unlaid her burden, was to unlaid her burden, I'm sorry. And finding disciples, we tarried there seven days, who said to Paul through the Spirit that he should not go up to Jerusalem. And when he had accomplished those days, we departed and went our way, and they all brought us on our way with wives and children till we were out of the city. And we kneeled down on the shore and prayed. And when we had taken our leave, one of the other, one of the other we took ship and, and they returned home again. And when we had finished our course from Tyre, we came to uh, uh, Ptolemais and, and saluted the brethren and abode with them one day. And the next day, <coughs> we that were with Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea. And we entered into the house of Philip, the evangelist, which was one of the seven, and abode with him. And the same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. And as we tarried there many days, there came down from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus. And when he was come unto us, he took Paul's girdle and bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus saith the Holy Ghost, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owneth this girdle, and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. And when we heard these things, both we and they of the, that place besought him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What mean ye to weep and to break mine heart? For I am ready uh, not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And when, we would not when <clears throat> he would not be persuaded, we cease saying, The will of the Lord be done. And after those days, we took up the carriages, our carriages, I'm sorry, and went unto Jerusalem. Uh, there went with us also certain of the disciples of Caesarea, and brought with them Mason of Cyprus, an old disciple, with whom we should lodge. And when we were come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We're thankful for these details, or very precise mentions of Paul's travels from Miletus to Jerusalem. And Lord, we see that he did get received very gladly by the brethren there. And yet there's trouble ahead. 
And Lord, we thank you for being with us on our journeys. We're thankful for the warnings you provide. We're thankful for the word of God uh, as we travel from uh, place to place, uh, meeting to meeting, uh, day to day, year to year, and Lord, from salvation into eternity. So Heavenly Father, I pray today that you would do exactly what you do as we meet. Lord, we gather together so you can build us, to equip us in the Word of God, to accomplish your mission and your power for your glory. Help us to heed the warnings that you give us. Help us to see uh, the commitment that uh, Paul had uh, to want to reach people. Help us to emulate that kind of love for Christ and for others. Help us to love you and others. And, and uh, this week even, as we travel to visit loved ones and friends, as we spend Thanksgiving uh, with our loved ones, Lord, I pray, God, that we would be committed uh, to sharing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we just thank you and we praise you and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing and reading with me this morning. <clears throat> so it's Thanksgiving week. It's upon us. And many of us will be traveling. We'll be visiting our family and our friends throughout the holiday. Some will travel out of state <clears throat> and others, uh, like me and Amy and our family, will be traveling around the metro, of course, to hit various family gatherings. So no matter how you travel, right, uh, you gotta have a yeah, gotta have a course, a chart. Oh, well, I guess you don't, but I do. I gotta know where I'm going, right? I don't just get in the car, start driving. Where are we gonna eat? Where are we gonna eat today, right? Uh, we have somewhere we're going, right? And if you're gonna buy airplane tickets and spend that kind of money, you know why you're going where you're going because you've charted it out in advance. So what I want to do this morning, uh, before we dive too deeply in the verse seven into these 17 verses, is just kind of do an overview and, and kind of look at the chart. As, uh, as we look at Paul charting the course to Jerusalem, God is charting a course for Paul. And that's part of the tension that I want to bring out this morning in the text, because it's very clear already, just with a casual read, and if you've noted some of the other warnings that we saw in chapter 20, that God is telling Paul, hey, uh, it's going to be rough going to Jerusalem. It's going to be tough. And, uh, and Paul is committed, of course, to going to Jerusalem, but God is committed to making sure Paul gets to Rome. Because Paul... Uh, wants to go to Jerusalem, and I believe God wants to get Paul to Rome. So uh, we'll talk about that uh, tension here as we go through the text. But before we do that, I just want to give an overview of the book as we go through this, uh, uh, the rest of this book in the book of Acts. So as we chart our co course, we see, first of all, that Rome is, is God's will. That's important to understand. Rome is God's will. God told Paul in the beginning of his ministry, Jerusalem would not receive him. So I want you to kind of understand that going into this message. Uh, Paul already told him, uh, you're not going to get anywhere uh, in Jerusalem. Uh, just look at Acts chapter 22 uh, in, in the next chapter. And look at the beginning of Paul's ministry. It says there very clearly, Paul, again, we'll get to this uh, next, uh, well, in a few weeks, actually. Uh, we'll get to this text. But just kind of to prime the pump a little bit, he says in Acts 22, verse 18, as he's giving his testimony... Going back to the beginning of his call, he says, and, and, and uh, I'll start in verse 17. And it came to pass that when I was come again to Jerusalem, even when I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance and saw him saying unto me, he's talking about the Lord, uh, at the end of verse 16, saw him saying unto me, make haste and get thee quickly out of Jerusalem, for they will not receive thy testimony concerning me. Paul made it very clear early in his ministry. Paul, you gotta, you gotta make, you gotta make like a baby and get out of here, man. You gotta head out because it's, it's, it's time to go. These folks will not receive my testimony through you in this city. It ain't gonna happen. Get out of Dodge. And so, if you continue on in the text down in verse 21, it says, "And he said unto me, Depart, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles." You, are, you got to get out of here, Paul. So that's part, part of Paul's testimony. Paul knew before he ever traveled to Jerusalem that God's will was for him to go to Rome. Uh, if you have your Bibles, just look over to Romans chapter 1 with me. You're going to have to do the old-fashioned turn in your Bible stuff here. Romans chapter 1. Look down in Romans chapter 1 and verse 10. Um, I'm not going to read the whole introduction. This is Paul's introduction to the book of Rome or to the Romans. Now he's he's written this book, uh, this epistle already before he went and traveled to um, to Jerusalem. So this is information he already has downloaded, processed, put in the hands of Phoebe, and sent to Rome. This is the epistle now we've received that Paul had already written before this time of Acts chapter 21. And it says in verse 10, uh, making uh, well, I'll start in verse 9. For God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. Right? They're important. 
their key city with key people, and he needs to get a key message there. Verse 10, making request, if by any means, now at length, that I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. I mean, I'm praying for this trip to you, for you guys. But of course, we know before I go to Rome, where else do I got to go? I got to get to Jerusalem, right? That's why he was bebopping all over Achaia and Macedonia and dropping in Troas and finds his way to Miletus because he has to get, in his mind, get to Jerusalem. He says in verse 11, For I long to see you, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift, to the end that ye may be established. This is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and of me. Now I would uh, not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was let hitherto, that I might have some fruit among uh, you also, even as among other Gentiles." And then he says this, he says, I'm a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are in Rome also. Paul knew this was important to get to Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God and his salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So the Apostle Paul, of course, uh, is on his way to Rome. And that's part of God's will. He knows that. It's God's will that he get to Rome. The Lord willing. Verse 10, he points that out. So Paul understood Rome's role among the Gentile nations, right? He had a full understanding of God's plan for the Gentile nations. He wrote Romans 9 through 11. Right? He understood that they were God's elect. He understood that, that God had put them on hold till the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. He understood where they were at already. Yet he wanted to make sure that he could, he could get down there and, and minister the gospel to them as well in Jerusalem. He had a full understanding of God's plan for the Gentile nations. He even mentions that he's a debtor to both, to the, uh, to the he, he mentions that he's taking the gospel, I'm sorry, to the Jew first and also the Greek. He had demonstrated that in all the different places that he went, right? He'd go to the synagogue and he'd preach the gospel to the Jew first. They were stewards of the law, and then he would go after they rejected it and hardened their hearts, then he would go ahead and go to the Gentiles. And the churches that were established in Macedonia and Achaia and, uh, were primarily started um, out of synagogues, but not always. Um, and he would use those believers that were Jewish in ethnicity and, and understanding, and they would come to faith, and he would use them oftentimes as the, as the, as the root, uh, the beginning of the church. So uh, God used that in a mighty way. Now, Paul understood that priority, but Paul also understood that God said, you ain't going to get anywhere in Jerusalem. Now, Paul also understood Daniel chapter 2. He understood Rome. You know, he always says to the Jew first and also the Greek. He doesn't say to the Roman. Because Paul understands the prophecies concerning Rome. Rome has a unique place in Gentile history when it comes to uh, how God uses Rome to handle the Gentile nations and ultimately bring in the Antichrist not many days hence. So Rome, um, Rome was the might of Gentile power. That's why it's a key city. It always has been. Like Jerusalem is a key city. Uh, Rome has been a key city ever since the Romans, uh, ever since Alexander, uh, his power diminished and Rome took on stewardship of Gentile nations uh, regarding uh, until the end times, until Jesus returns and destroys the Antichrist system. So Rome is in a, I just said a lot. Don't worry about it. Go back. We got Revelations and Daniel online. Go study all that. But the bottom line is this. In that, uh, Daniel, or Daniel 2 was very something that, that Paul understood. He understood what God was going to do through Rome. He understood why it was a key city. Uh, but he, didn't, he understood that that was the might, right? That was the iron that was mixed with clay that controlled the world. Paul understood that. And so he understood Rome was a key place. But he also understood the Greeks, right? He understood that was the wisdom of the Gentile world. So you have the, you have the Greek, uh, then the wisdom. Paul was a Greek speaker, and, and, and they had the mind of the Gentile power. And both the Greek and the Roman uh, had assimilated together to bring this incredible power to the Gentile world, which should ultimately be used of God to influence the world with the gospel. And so, and so praise the Lord for that. In his introduction, he, he made that mention of the Jew first and also the Greek. The kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom. Uh, political and spiritual Rome does not have an inheritance in the kingdom of God because they claim the promises of Israel to this day. They and those that are their spawns today will claim and grasp onto the promises of the nation of Israel and call themselves the Israel 
of God, meaning all the inheritance that God has for the nation of Israel will come to them. Therefore, the prophecies that have gone before on Israel will not be fulfilled. Now, of all the times in history to believe that nonsense, this is not the time because God has made it abundantly clear throughout recent history since 1918, 1948, 1968, and today that God is doing something in Israel. Since our current president said, no, the capital of Israel is not Tel Aviv, where our brethren landed today. It's actually Jerusalem. Doesn't everyone know that? It's what the Bible says, right? So, so you understand the Bible teaches us, uh, you know, this, we know these things because this is the same Bible the Apostle Paul had. This is the same information we have to work with because God used Paul to bring it to us. So we would have clarity on these things. So this stuff is already established. Paul understands the might of the Gentile powers is Rome. He understands the mind of the Gentile powers is the Greek in their system of, of education and thinking. And so that's why, uh, that's why he was, uh, his gospel was such a threat. That's why when, when Herod uh, the Great wasn't so great, when he heard about a little baby, right? we'll be celebrating Christmas coming up here soon, when Jesus would come to this earth, a little baby, he was willing to kill innocent children as insurance against biblical prophecy. It's an amazing thing. Paul understood that God would restore Israel and have her as the seat of God's government. He understood Isaiah 9-6. He believed Zechariah chapter 14. He understood what the Word of God said about Jesus' second coming and the return of Christ. And Paul had already, like I had said, he had written Romans 9-11. through And he had said this in Romans 11-25, For I would not, brethren, talking to the church, Brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest, I should be wise, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Now, the fullness of the Gentiles isn't the same thing as the times of the Gentiles. The fullness of the Gentiles is speaking till the day that God catches up the church, when the Gentile church is brought in and, and then we are caught up, we're taken away. And then God turns his full attention to re restoring the nation of Israel and fulfilling his promises in the Daniel 70th week. So Paul understood that. Paul wrote that. Paul is the one that already said that. But Paul didn't intend to stop in Rome, even knowing all those things about history, both uh, in the past and, and future, what God's going to do. He wrote to the Romans in Romans 15, 24, and he says, you know, uh, whosoever I take, uh, <coughs> uh, whensoever, I'm sorry, I take my journey into Spain... I will come to you. So Paul says, I have every intention to come to you, for I trust to see you in my journey and to be brought on my way uh, thitherward by you. So save some pennies, because if first I be somewhat filled with your company, uh, when therefore I have performed this, verse 28, and have seal, uh, sealed to them this fruit, I will come by you into Spain. I want to come to you guys, and I want to give you a spiritual gift, and I want to spend some time, but I also want you guys to know that my plan isn't to stay in Rome. I'm on my way to Spain. So Paul had plans. It wasn't Rome altogether. It was to go on to Spain, right, and, and uh, probably to go on from there. And so Paul was planning uh, to stop into Rome, not to stay there. Of course, that's not how his life ended. Paul uh, may have gotten a little ahead of himself. It's clear that Paul's last stop was Rome. There's no biblical evidence he ever made it to Spain, but his epistles did. And, and James reminds us in Matthew 6 that we, right, we don't take any thought for the morrow. For the morrow takes all the things of itself, sufficient in the days of evil thereof. Right? So, so, the, so James, the, the apostle says in James 4, verse 13, Go now. Ye, ye that, st that say, today or tomorrow we will go such into such a city and, and uh, continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain, whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. Uh, for what is your life? It's even a vapor that appeareth for a little time, then vanisheth away. For ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. Now I want to be fair to the Apostle Paul. He did preface in his introduction to the Romans if the Lord will, right? The Lord willing. And you'll see that phrase come up in Acts 21 as well because we have a conflict between what Paul's will is and what God's will is. Because God's already said, Paul, don't go to Jerusalem. You're not going to have any fruit there. But Paul says, hey, that's okay. I'll die there. So what do you do with that? Well, I'll tell you what to do with it here in just a minute. So hang on to that. Because because Jerusalem is Paul's will. It's Paul's will. In that same epistle, the book of, uh, to the Romans, go to Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9, and look over there in verse 1. This is, a, a, this is a really beautiful because it reveals the heart 
of the Apostle Paul. Romans chapter 9 and verse 1, he says, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. Paul's heart was grieved. For I could wish that myself were cursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises. So Paul says, man, I tell you guys, I am so grieved. I'm so vexed that if I could lose my salvation, if I could say, God, send me to hell so my relatives could be saved, I would do it. Now, Paul can't do that, right? He's obviously not going to... You can't do that. But Paul's like willing to... He's like, I, could just, I would just... I would forsake anything eternal so that, my, so that my family could have eternal life. That's really practical, isn't it? Because this week, some of us might... We might be spending time with family who are lost. You know, do we sit around and think about that as we're getting ready to travel for, for Thanksgiving dinner? Man, Lord, what I would give to see that my family is saved. I mean, really, that should be the priority. Now, obviously, I was just telling the mighty warriors, you've got to pray for open doors too, right? Because trying to tell someone the gospel through a door doesn't work very well. Hey, I want to tell you about Jesus! You're just like a weirdo, right? The door's shut. They can't hear you. So pray for open doors, doors of utterance. But that's what Paul wanted. He just wanted to get back to his family, his brethren, the Israelites, and just tell them, hey guys, you got to know I don't deserve this. He's guilty, man. He's, he's one of them. He's no better than them. Well, yeah, they're hard heads. Yeah, they're knuckleheads. But he's like, so am I. We can see that. Yes, I am a hard head. I want to do what I want to do. But I want to get to Jerusalem and tell my, my brethren, man, that they need Jesus Christ. He's their Messiah, too. And he wanted to get that message across. Go to chapter 10. Look at what he says there. His introduction, or not introduction, those first verses. Again, I like the way he capitalizes it so we know we are his brothers. He's so, he's so caught up in his Israelite brothers, you might wonder, well, is he a Jew or is he a Christian? He's a Christian. He says, brethren, talking to all of us. You know, in Christ you're a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new, right? We, we're in Christ, you're a new creature. You're not Jew or Greek. You're a new creature. So Paul, he wrote that. He knows that. He understands that. So he's talking at a human level, though. He's saying, brethren, those in the body of Christ, all of us that are new creatures, I need you to know this. Uh, my heart's desire, right, as a human, my heart's desire in prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved, for I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness, because Jesus is the righteousness of God, and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Right? He's saying, I'm so heavy, man. My heart's desire in prayer is that Israel might be saved. That's what God, or that's what Paul wanted. Now, God wants that too. Don't misunderstand me. God wants that too. But God has been giving them every opportunity to get saved, starting with Christ Jesus himself being born in Bethlehem, <laughs> being raised, going three and a half years publicly, proclaiming John the Baptist, preparing the way of the Lord, making his path straight, allowing the Lord Jesus Christ to manifest himself clearly to the nation of Israel, allowing the nation of Israel to crucify him so he become our sacrifice for sin, and then him rising again the third day according to the scripture, accomplishing that which the Bible had been foreshadowing for centuries, that, that a lamb would be offered as a sacrifice for sin. So behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. You get it yet, Israel? Let me, sit, let, me, let me send these 12 wild men to Jerusalem to preach some more about this. Let me give you another chance, right? The book of Acts, chapter, chapters 1, chapters 2, the Holy Spirit comes down and they're in Jerusalem proclaiming the Messiah. The miracles are evident. We covered all of that, right? He's given Israel every opportunity to receive him in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and now through the ministry of the Apostle Paul in the uttermost parts of the earth in that generation. Paul's like, uh, but I got to go back. God's like, and you got to get to Rome. Interesting tension there in the text. Paul didn't intend to stop in Rome. He wanted to go on. 
But Jerusalem was, was really part of, God, part of uh, the plan for the Apostle Paul. Now, reconciling God's perfect will with his permissive will is the tension that we have in the room. Because I know if you've read all the commentaries, they're going to tell you, well, this was God's will, and God, it was just God warning what was yet to come. Well, it is God's will because God allowed it. God didn't have to allow it, right? He could have, told, he could have just stopped the boat, <laughs> right? See, Jonah said, no, I won't go to Nineveh. And God said, no, Jonah, you will go to Nineveh. And he made it happen. So God did allow this. God is allowing Paul to fulfill this purpose in his life. Though God's bigger purpose is definitely to get Paul to where? Rome. So we call that the permissive will of God. God allows us to do some things, even if it's not top on his agenda. Now, God lays that out for us in the book of Romans chapter 12, through the Apostle Paul, I might add. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Paul is doing that. He's like, I'm ready to die. I'm ready to die. We read it in chapter 17. Or 21, I'm sorry. Uh, and he said, I'm ready to die. Be not conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God had dealt to every man the measure of faith. So Paul was not going to relent because his heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Now, Paul understood God was done with the Jews for a season. How do I know that? Because he had already written Romans 9 through 11. Paul's heart for huma his humanity, his passion, his love for his people would not allow him to finish his course without one last opportunity to preach the gospel to those Jews as he did to the Jews at Corinth. I mean, he'd been out all over the Gentile world, entering the synagogues, getting beat up, getting thrown out, getting, you know, causing riots. He's like, God, if you would, just one more time, I got to get back to Jerusalem. I'm going to take a big fat gift with me, but I got to get back here. Why? Because I want to preach one more time, even if it kills me. So God permitted it. So we, so, so we have the following. God, God's will, right, which was in Rome... Paul's will, which is in Jerusalem, but then we got God's perfect will, his complete will, which will be fulfilled in Rome. It's still going to happen. And we have, and we have God's uh, acceptable or his, his permissive will, which will be accomplished in Jerusalem. And God will use all of it because God is sovereign. For all the folks out there that think that I don't believe in God's sovereignty. Oh, I do believe in God's sovereignty. I think he's so sovereign, he can take your individual will and still get the right answer. No matter what you do. But you better watch your heart. Because if Paul's heart was in the wrong spot, this could have ended tragically for Paul and those he preached to. So don't play around with God. God Paul was taking a lot on by doing this. I'll say that. Because God is God. He didn't want, <clears throat> if he didn't want or allow Paul to go to Rome, he would not have allowed it. Paul is going to Rome. And Paul going to Rome, by the way, is not an assault on God's sovereignty. And it's not an assault on God's character at all. It's a revelation of how the deity gives grace and mercy to humanity. Because you know what? Jesus is touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He knows more than anybody how Paul feels about Israel. God is the one who sent his only begotten son. In the councils of the Godhead, who in their right mind would think that you would send Jesus Christ to this earth to save wretches like us? But he did it anyway. Paul's like, God, if you could just let me go. I just want to go. I know it doesn't make sense. I know, but I'm just following your example. Because I know what Peter's going to write in 2 Peter 3, 9, that you're not willing that any perish, but that all succumb to repentance. Before you pour your wrath out on your people, let me go preach one more time. That's what Paul's thinking. Man, that's what we should be thinking. What's it going to take for us to get the gospel where it needs to go on time? Because we know what time it is. We know the wrath of God's coming. We have the word of God written. We have the full counsel of God. So what in the world, man? We ought to be like crazy men and women. Getting the word of God where it needs to go on time. God and Paul, they had a thing going on. <laughs> 
Oh, man, they both want the Jews to be saved. God and Paul didn't... uh, God may not have liked the timing of Paul, but he still gave him grace anyway. And Paul just wanted the Israelites to have the same grace that he had. God is long-suffering. He's kind. Paul was, was taking a gift, by the way, I mentioned this already, to bless those believers. We talked about that. I'll talk to you more later about it. But the Apostle Paul did have a purpose and I don't think it was a ruse. He was wanting the Gent- he wanted the Jews. Maybe if they see the grace of God among the Gentiles, maybe that'll soften their heart. And of course, among the church, they did receive him gladly. We've already read that. So God allowed Paul to go and go and still accomplish his sovereign purpose with Paul and the Jews. So Acts twenty one, it marks the end of the beginning of our DNA heritage. You you've heard it said and. That it's the beginning of the end. But this is really not the beginning of the end. This is the end of the beginning. So here's a quick flyover of the itinerary, the flight plan. In Acts chapter 21, uh, as we've already seen, Paul travels from Jerusalem to Jerusalem. And he enters the Roman custody, as I mentioned, in Acts 21-31. And he never leaves it. In Acts 22 through 23-22, Paul shares his testimony in Jerusalem. In Acts 23, 23 through 26, 32, Paul then goes on and he shares his testimony in Caesarea. So he does get to preach. He does get to share his testimony. That's, that's really all he's wanting to do. And he's, he, he's, he, uh, uh, he's transferred in uh, 23, 23 through 25, and then he, he goes to Caesarea. And it's there in Caesarea he gets to preach to Governor Felix, and then to, uh, he's in prison there, and then he gets to preach before Governor Felix and King Agrippa. And so he has an opportunity there to, uh, I should say Felix Festus, and then uh, Felix and King Agrippa. And then Paul in Acts 27, verses 28 through 15, he takes uh, a troubled trip to Rome. And so on his last journey to Rome, it's not as smooth as it was getting to Jerusalem. And he has a troubled time. We'll look at that. And then in Acts 28, 16 through 31, Paul's transferred from Roman custody to Jesus' custody as he runs out his final ministry. So we see Paul fulfilled the prophecy of Ananias recorded in in Acts 9.15. When he got saved and they were wondering if this guy was even somebody they could mess with. God God told Ananias, But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. So here's the practical application of of that point. Paul is a unique vessel in the kingdom of God. There's no way around it. He is unique. But God's will is still that nobody perishes, right? He doesn't want anyone to, to perish. He wants all men everywhere to be saved. So have you answered your call? God will use you and your humanity, to, your humanity to, to accomplish His divine purposes. That's why He puts Himself in you. That's the divinity that you need. It's not a spark that you fan, right? That's not, that's not even in the Bible. There's songs, I listened to some Christian songs recently. Man, you've got to watch what's out there on the radio, man. It's crazy stuff. They got holy water, sparks of divinity flying around. No, listen, you must be born again. God puts his divinity in us, Christ in us, the hope of glory. And he allows it to work in our humanity so we can accomplish his mission. Paul understood God's plan and will for the Jews, but he is, he's <clears throat> still not willing to see them perish any more than Jesus was. And if it were possible, he would have given up his life, even his salvation, to see his loved ones saved. And would to God we would be so motivated. You know, God's not a robot, nor are we. God allows us to see this struggle in Paul because he hopes that we would have the same. I mean, would to God we would struggle over knowing how things are going to end and knowing where things are today. God forbid that we just sit back and say, oh, let God drive. It's all going to, que sera, sera. It's going to be as it's going to be. God didn't put us here to see it just go off the cliff. He put us here to preach the gospel while we got time. He's given us the knowledge of his word, not so that we can say, oh, that's how it all ends. What a nice storybook. It's because this is the script for history, and he's, in, he's put us in play, in place, to do something about it. Because he's not willing that any perish. He wants us to preach the gospel. He wants us to care about humanity the way he cared about humanity. And that's why he put himself in us. It's not so we can be narcissistic and say, oh, I got my best life now. It's so we can see people uh, saved from a literal burning hell and inherit eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And this week is Thanksgiving, man. 
Perhaps we need to take some time and be thankful for we, what we've got and consider those who don't have it. Not money, not cars, not affluence, not wealth, which those are great things to have. Food, raiment, all those things, great things to have. Praise the Lord. Be thankful for those things. But most importantly, if you're saved this morning, sit back and consider the grace that God has given you through Jesus Christ your Lord. And consider the outcome of what happens if the people in your sphere of influence don't have that grace. What will eternity look like for them? As you're collecting their money through business transactions, as you're going through your life having jokes with them, as you're spending time over the coffee fountain with people, as you're, as you're rubbing up elbows at family get-togethers, man, we ought to be grieved when we know those people whom we had to do are not saved. Oh God, would we preach the gospel? Would we live the gospel? Would we, would we wake up in the morning and get in the Word of God? Would we allow the Word of God to wash over us so we don't foul, smell foul to the world in which we live? May we be a sweet-smelling savor. May they see the love of Christ radiate out of our life because they know that we're the real deal. People will come to Christ if we're not carnal. Traveling to Jerusalem, man, God's going to chart a course. He's charting our courses this week. He wants all of us to witness. I'm talking here to save folks. Paul travels and, and, and he, goes, uh, he goes to these uh, key cities. So as you travel, make sure that you don't miss your connections. In Acts, go back to our text here in Acts chapter 21. And I'm just going to skip over this and, and uh, I'm not going to dive too deep for time's sake. But we see here that Paul travels to and through these key cities. I've already mentioned how important key cities are, so I'm just going to touch on them. In Acts 20 and verse 17, we saw that Paul was in Miletus. And then he travels about 40 uh, miles uh, to Acts 21.1 where we find that they go to this, this strange looking word. It looks like coos, but it's costs. It's the birthplace of the physician, Hippocrates, which is where we get the Hippocratic Oath. And so it's famous for, for that. Uh, and so Paul goes to this city, and then from there, Paul and his company, they sailed, they traveled to an island of Rhodes. And it's there that he entered into a harbor. In that harbor was a 106-foot tall brass statue of Apollo. I can imagine as Paul came into that harbor, he sees that pagan statue, man. This is one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And then from Rhodes, Paul traveled in another ship uh, to Patera and the lands on the seacoast of Asia Minor near a river called Xanthus. And then from there in Patera, they sailed south. Just going east of the island of Cyprus, they sailed past it to Tyre. And this is the destination of the cargo leaving from Patera. So in Acts chapter 21, verses 3 through 7, in Tyre, Paul will visit the local church and he's going to spend three weeks there, verses 3 through 7. And, tie, and, uh, and it's from there uh, that they go to, to uh, uh, Apollos, and, and it's the scene of their departure. And that departure is much like what we see in Acts chapter 20, verses 36 through 38. The disciples understand what's laying ahead of them. They're very grieved to see Paul go, and they love and they care for him as they leave. And then they go their own way, and Paul and the team can tra travel on. And they travel uh, from there to the coast of Caesarea. And from Caesarea, Paul and his companions travel to Jerusalem. The team is received gladly by the saints in Jerusalem. And it seems like a happy ending. If we just ended the story right there, man, it would be nice. Uh, but that is, the, that, is the, that is the connections. Those are the physical connections that are made. It's just like if you go to the airport, just like Steve and, and Luke traveling to Israel. They had to make a lot of connections uh, to get to their destination. So Paul's hitting all those connections. But he's not just making physical connections. Paul's making connections with the key saints. Because Luke will no longer leave Paul's side. Notice in verse 1 it says, And it came to pass that after we were gotten from them. You'll never see Luke away from, from Paul again. He's going to be by Paul's side. It's going to be we. It's going to be us. It's not going to be them. It's going to be us. So Paul's got a, he's got a, a friend that sticks close, like a brother, in addition to the Lord Jesus Christ. So Luke, the great physician, is going to be handy because Paul's going to need him, I'm sure, on these travels because he's got a rough road ahead. And he will not leave Paul's side. In 2 Timothy 4, in that swan song, the apostle Paul wrote to his son in the Lord Timothy, requesting that he come to Rome. He said, only Luke is with me. He was with him to the end. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. So Paul had Luke with him the entire time. That was a key man. You know, as you go through this life, sometimes, uh, I mean, Mike Blake one time told me, he says, I lost another friend. 
You know, sometimes in the ministry, you lose friends. It's over doctrine, it's over this, it's over that. But there's, unfortunately, it's much like the Bible, right? And so, uh, and so it's, it's hard to, to lose friends when someone won't do the right thing, someone falls into sin, won't repent. Because, you know, we've got to keep going forward. We've got to keep pressing on. And it's hard. doesn't mean it doesn't hurt, but that's what you've got to do because we're in this to win it. And uh, yeah, we've got to go after the, the, you know, the one out of the 99 and all of those things. But at the end of the day, even God's saying, hey, Paul, go on to Rome. I'll take care of these guys later. You get the mission done because there's a lot of people that need to hear the message on time and they will receive it. They will receive it. And so Paul, he has these key connections, man. The men like Luke, they're hard to come by. People that will be with you through thick, through thin, through up and down. You guys got those people in your life? I hope you do. I'm blessed with a multitude of them. And, uh, man, it's a blessing. So, if you, by the way, if you want to have friends like that, you need to be a friend like that. That's how, that's how you get to be. Uh, you know what? Paul was there for Luke, I believe, and that's why Luke was there for Paul. So Paul found uh, his disciples also uh, in, in uh, Tyre. In verse 4, it says that uh, in finding disciples, and that encur that's encouraging, he found them. Uh, he knew they were there. We tarried there seven days. He spent a, he spent a week there, a full week. And, <clears throat> and they told Paul too, hey, by the way, don't go to Jerusalem. <laughs> don't do it, Paul. Uh, this is what the Spirit's saying to us. But he had some disciples. He spent seven days, and he's warned of the Holy Spirit, what's going to befall him. And then after a loving departure, he sent off in verse 5. It says there, And when we had accomplished those days, we departed and went our way. And they all brought us on our way with wives and children till we were out of the city. It was a family affair. And they kneeled down on the shore and they prayed. And they were probably snotting and doing everything they did in Ephesus as well. And so Paul took time for a day trip. He goes down to verse 7 and he drops in at uh, Ptolemus and he saluted the brethren and abode with them one day. So he had time for a day trip. He made time for people. He took time out of his life to make connections with key saints. He couldn't go everywhere. But as he was traveling to these connection points, he made sure to take time out to talk to key people, to key disciples, and to travel with key men. Paul entered the house of Philip, the evangelist in Caesarea. Philip was the deacon. Uh, and he is uh, now Philip the Evangelist. He's counted as one of the seven. The seven who? You know, uh, not gunfighters. He's, he's one of the seven deacons in Acts chapter 6. And so he would have known who personally? That's right. He would have known Stephen. Man, what a special meeting that would have been for the Apostle Paul. Can you imagine that? Man, I got to get down to see, got to get down to see Philip the Evangelist. And I heard about that revival that broke loose down there in, in um, uh, Ethiopia because he led that uh, Ethiopian unique to Christ, and I'm hearing reports. Apollos told me about it because he's got friends down there in, in uh, Egypt that heard about it. It's incredible what's going on. I got to get down there. I got to see Philip the Evangelist in Caesarea. He's not just the deacon now. He's he's known as the evangelist. He's a gift to the body, and you know what he's you know what he you know it's not in the text, but I know what Paul was talking about when they got together. You can't help but talk about old war buddies. You remember Stephen? Tell me about Stephen. This is what I remember about Stephen. I remember how God used him to convict me of my sin so I could get saved. What do you know about Stephen? Oh, man, Paul, he was incredible. I mean, nobody could resist his wisdom. That's why you got saved. Yeah, you're right, man. That guy, he brought the word, didn't he? Yeah, and they're talking about Stephen, the one that Paul martyred. You guys ought to do some traveling sometime. I know Jeff and, and several of you guys, Jason and several others, have been to India It'll wreck you, man, when you're sitting there and there's a, there's a guy who was trying to kill someone in that seat and the guy who was trying to kill on that in the next seat and now they're slapping hands and high-fiving and praising Jesus together and they're serving God, preaching the gospel. It blows you away. You're like, what in the world? It's Jesus. Jesus does that today. It's amazing. It's amazing the power of the gospel. You're worried about how it's going to get received because you might get rejected. I tell you, spend some time with some people who have been persecuted a little bit, and then you'll just kind of, all that will go away. It's amazing. I can't imagine. That would have been awesome. I'd have loved to have been a fly on the wall when Paul met with, with, with uh, Philip in Caesarea. That would have been some good meeting. That would have been cool. The time is... Uh, quite a time span. We're not given all the details, but it's noted that Philip had four virgin daughters who prophesied. It's the last time, by the way, in the, uh, that you see that. 
uh, previous to this, all the female prophetesses are in the Old Testament. And there's four of them. And uh, I neglected to put them in my notes, so I can't give you all those today, but I can get those to you. Uh, I know Deborah was one, and uh, my brain is going a week. So there's, uh, there's four of them in the Old Testament. So they stayed there until Agabus, the prophet, came down. And Agabus is noted in Acts eleven twenty eight. So he's someone that Paul's seen before. He, he prophesied about the dearth that would come during the days of Claudius Caesar. So there were certain disciples in, in uh, Caesarea, Mason of Cyprus, who, who cared for the team's lodging. And these relationships are worth noting because Paul uh, would never pass through these parts again. You know, these are, there's some touches that you have with folks. You know, I did not know the last time I went out with uh, uh, Bob Weston to eat dinner. That was my last time to go out with Bob Weston. I'm so glad he traveled through these parts. I'm so glad I paused. And I said, you know what? I wasn't there that Sunday. Let me go touch with... I'm glad we did that. I'm glad we were able to touch base. Because that was special for me that day. It's more special now than it was the day that we met. Isn't that awesome? You don't really know the impact you make in people's lives sometimes. You're just kind of, you're passing through, going from here to there. You know, the next thing you know, oh, you're not going to make it to Spain. This is as far as you're going to go. Time's up. And the Lord calls you home. Make sure you're making good connections along the way. Not just at your, not your ports of entry alone, right? But with the people. The people. I mean, there's people in this life, and you know who they are. They're sweet. They love the Lord, and they love people, and, and it's just a pleasure to be with them. It's a pleasure to be around them. You laugh. You, you talk about the Bible. You have a good time. And then there's other people that, man, it's like, oh, my gosh, take a bath. You stink. Your attitude stinks. Your outlook stinks. Your faith stinks. Man, here's a cup of water. No, you don't need to drink it. Let's pour it on your head. You need to be washed in the water of the Word of God. You need to be cleaned up. You need God's Word to work in you, to dwell in you richly. And all wisdom, because the things that you think are important are simply not important. The things that are important is the Word of God, the souls of men, and where we get it to go, where we take it, and the people we take it with. We don't know what tomorrow will bring, so we need to cherish the relationships God gives us. Sometimes we do know what tomorrow will bring. And we especially need to cherish the relationships that God gives us. Because if they're saved, it's just see you later. But man, when they're lost, it's, see at the, it's the great white throne judgment, see you later. Man, it's going to be a tough deal. For us that are saved, we never really say goodbye. It's just see you later. So Paul receives, he receives the key message. And you know, you hear me say before so often, I'm, the key message is what? What's the key message all the way through this series I've been talking about? Yeah, the gospel though, the simple gospel. That's what Paul's, but you know what? That's not the message Paul's getting, is it? <laughs> In this particular section of the text, the key message isn't the gospel, Paul's going to give that, of course. That's part of the deal. This testimony, he goes on trial. We'll get to all that later. But particularly what we're seeing in the first 17 verses, really uh, beyond that, is a warning from God saying, Paul, look out. Heads up. This is what's coming. The time to focus... <clears throat> The, 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 time, the, the time, the focus of the message... This time, I'm sorry, the focus of the message isn't the gospel. The message that we keep seeing reiterated is Paul... You're heading to trouble. You're, having, you're, you're, going to get, you're going to run into a hard group of people. So Paul received the four warnings of what awaited him in Judea. The first one was in Acts 22. We already pointed it out when God told him, hey, get out of Jerusalem. So before he even started his public ministry uh, to any degree, God's like, hey, you're not coming back around these parts and going to have any fruit, Paul. Go away to the Gentiles. That's where the fruit's at. So we had that general warning early on. But even after that... Um, in Acts chapter 20 and verse 23, we saw that the Apostle Paul, through the Spirit of God, received this, this warning when the, when the saints said, Save the Holy Ghost witnesses in every city, saying the bonds and afflictions await me. Paul knew that he was headed to trouble. That didn't stop him, verse 23 of chapter 20. The Lord warned him in tires. We already saw the disciples, tear, they tarried their seven days, and they said to Paul, through the Spirit, that he should not go up to Jerusalem. 
And then the Lord warned Paul again through Agabus, as we see in verse 11. And when he was come unto us, he took Paul's girdle and bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus saith the Holy Ghost, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem, very specific, bind the man that owneth this girdle and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Paul's response is the same. Look at what he says. And when we heard these things, notice, notice Luke is including himself in this. When we heard these things, both we and they of that place, we being the apostles, the disciples that were traveling with him, and they that were living there, uh, giving this information, the listening to Agabus, listening to those uh, prophets, those daughters of, of uh, uh, Philip, besought him not to go up to Jerusalem. Everybody, including Luke, the author of this epistle says, Paul, you don't have to do this. We'll take the gift. You get on a ship. You go on over to Rome, man. And Paul's like, oh, don't break my heart. What are you guys saying? Look in verse 13. Then, then Paul, verse 13. What mean ye to weep and to break my heart? For I'm not... <laughs> he's a hardhead. For I am ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord, of, of, of the Lord Jesus. I'm willing to die. So Paul was offering his life as a free will offering. God wasn't forcing this on Paul. This was all on Paul. Even if I die, yea, though they slay, slay me, he's going he's to go forward and he's going to go to Jerusalem. God made it clear, Paul didn't have to sacrifice in Jerusalem. He didn't have to go and be bound in Jerusalem. He would not... Uh, he didn't have to, he wouldn't even allow him to be the sacrifice there. He's like, Paul, you're not going to die there because I got business in Rome. That is kind of encouraging, though. You ever get in a scary situation? I was in a foreign country one time and I opened up the paper <laughs> and uh, I'm reading about this guy who just got arrested the day before and, he's, and, he, and he was showing the Jesus film. And as I'm reading that paper, I'm like, oh, I got four of those bad boys on me right now. <laughs> and uh, I'm thinking, you know, if I don't get out of here, I guess don't get out of here. At least I went down fighting. You know, go down with your boots on. And uh, praise the Lord. I think that's how Paul felt as well. You want to you go out doing what God's called you to do. Now, we can all say, man, you shouldn't have done that. You shouldn't have done that. But how are you going to argue with that? God's going to permit that. And say, okay, Paul, you go here and you preach one more time. I know, I mean, I know I've I put a lot in this city and they haven't received me. But maybe, Paul, because you're Paul... They're going to really respond to you. <laughs> of course not. But go ahead, Paul, because you know what? God can see the heart. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. I don't think God would have had one problem, though, if Paul would have said, you know what, God, you're right. It's just not, it's not, it's not good there. Now, there's a lot of people who disagree with me on this, that Paul had to go to Jerusalem. I don't think he did. I think God was already done with Israel at that, or with Jerusalem at that point. Romans 9 through 11 was already written. Thus saith the Lord God. I'll take care of that in Daniel's 70th week. Paul, go to the Gentiles. I think Paul would have been fine if he just got on the next boat and went to Rome. And he probably would have got to Spain. Who knows? He may have gotten to, to, to England. But the bottom line is that's not how it went. And God allowed it. Because God knows what it's like to love people. And to do crazy things. And you know what, if that's the mistakes you're going to make in life, sacrificing your life for people that won't receive the gospel, going to hard places that, where people, you don't, people say, nobody's ever going to get saved there. If that's the way you want to live your life, you know what, go for it. I'm a pastor. I did that for 10 years. I preached in a mission. And I, I preached to people, like, like, oftentimes it's like bouncing off the wall. And I'm like, you know what, God will get the glory someday, the great white throne. At least they know God loves them. But then one day God said... Hey, Brian, why don't you invest in the church? That has better dividends. Oh, that's a good idea. And so that's the way I went. But you know what? God blesses both. God blesses both. A few years ago, there was a guy named John Allen Chow. You remember that guy? Man, when that guy, he, got, he was martyred on the island out there in the, in the uh, Indian Ocean trying to reach these uh, um, uh, Sentinelese Indians. And these folks, to this day, they're an unreached people. They're all isolated on an island. And man, the news coverage, that guy was nuts. What are you doing? The world doesn't understand that. But not only that, the Christians, not all the Christian publications. Oh man, what was he thinking? What was he doing? <laughs> the guy was taking the, the gospel to the world the best way he knew how. 
And they all thought he was foolish. And they all thought he was stupid. And they all thought he didn't know what he was doing. And come to find out, after they really checked into it, there's still an article out on Christianity Today. This guy was actually very prepared. He'd taken shots. He didn't want to infect anybody. I mean, he did, he did everything he could do as a precaution to make sure that he wouldn't hurt the people, the indigenous people that, of that location. And he also knew he could likely die. Anyone, anyway. And we'll see him in heaven. And so praise the Lord. You know, Jim Elliott said, He is no fool who gives that which he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. So what am I doing for the gospel? I mean, hey, John Chow, or, go for it. At least he did something. Well, that was foolish. Was it? We'll find out at the judgment seat of Christ how foolish it was. Traveling to Jerusalem, man. I tell you, we've got to chart a course. We've got to make connections. And then ultimately, they arrive safely. Look at verse 17. They get down there, and look how he gets received by the brethren. And when they were come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. So God gave a final warning in verses 11 through 12. He says, Paul, this is how it's going to go down. Agabus gave that warning. Then God granted Paul uh, his permissive will. He says, Paul, I, I've told you, I've warned you, I've let you know what's going to happen. So here we go. I know this because Paul, Paul would not have arrived safely to Jerusalem or arrived at all if God didn't allow it. And likewise, I don't think God would have been disappointed in that fact if Paul would have changed his mind. But Paul was received safely and gladly by the brethren. The problem, by the way, was not the saints. It was the Jews. They were hostile to the gospel. And they are to this day. When you proclaim that Jesus Christ is their Messiah. That he was God manifest in the flesh. That he died on the cross, not just for our sins, but for their sins. And the fullness of the word of God, the law and the prophets are found in him. And the way to salvation is through Jesus Christ and him alone. They still get mad at that message. Nonetheless, Paul was willing, as one of them, to die if he had to, to get the gospel to their hardened heart. And you think about Luke 16, when that rich man died. Remember Lazarus and the beggar? And Lazarus the beggar's out there, and the rich man, you know, if he could just drop some trash off the trash can, that, that beggar would scoop it up, and one day the rich man dies and goes to hell, and Lazarus dies, and he's in Abraham's bosom, and the rich man is saying, hey, Man, I had all this wealth, I had all this stuff, but I just, I just need Abraham, send somebody back to tell, to tell my family. To tell my family. Paul knew that. He'd probably heard that, that account. He knew about that account in Luke 16. And before Paul went to Rome, he said, Lord, I don't want to go to heaven. I don't want to have all these crowns. I would give up every crown I have if I could see my nation, my brother in Israel, saved. You can have my crowns because I would rather be a curse than to see these people be lost. I'm willing to give my life. It's hard to argue because that's the kind of attitude Jesus had. I'll give up everything, Father, to love what you love because you tell us you love the world and it grieves you so deeply that they're lost. What is it going to cost? Everything. Okay. Sir, yes, sir. I'll do it. Have you made your travel plans? If you die today, do you know where you'd spend eternity? You need to make those plans if you haven't. Today is the day of salvation. You need to get on board. Because I'll tell you what, your connections in life don't really count. <laughs> Not until you really know Christ. That's the most important connection. If you miss that one, you're going to spend eternity separated from God. And for those of us that are saved this morning, are you making your connections? Are you connecting with God daily? Are you, are, you, are you in Christ? Are you traveling with Christ the way Luke traveled with Paul? Are you in it thick and thin, tight with the Lord? Even when you're going in a direction, God's like, I don't know if you should do that. That's going to be, you're going to be preaching to the wall. God would much rather have us out preaching to the wall and being zealous about the wall than not doing anything, waiting on him to sovereignly come down and preach the gospel in our stead. He put us here in Christ's stead to reconcile men to God. That's why we're here. And Christians, are we willing to, to place our life in God's hands no matter what and travel any road that God leads us for the gospel's sake? Oh, you're like, I'll do it, pastor. I'll do it. I'll do it. Good. I'm, saying, I'm glad you said that. Now, 
How about your children or your grandchildren? What if your child's John Chow? What if your child, your grandchild, wants to go to one of these God-forsaken countries and give their life? If they're forsaken, it's only because we haven't gotten the gospel there. There's more, there's more Muslims willing to get saved right now than probably Americans, to be honest with you. What if your kid says, you know what, I could do that. I'll go. Oh, no, 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 don't, don't, don't. What are you talking about, man? That's the gospel. What does God want? Is what God wants what we want? Make the connections. Make the connections. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time in your word. I pray that we would meditate upon these things, that we would give ourselves wholly to it, Lord, that we would...